this is the second half of chapter 10, so we're going to try to uh, do 4, 5, and 6, or at least as far as we get. Okay, so we're going to talk about, um, starting with 9, valuation issues. And then we're going to cost subsequent acquisition, and then we're going to dispose of them. All right. So basically, um, usually what we buy property, plant, and equipment for in financial accounting is cash, which you record. If I bought a car for $10,000, a debit car for $10,000 and credit cash. Notice that you record property, plant, and equipment at the fair value of what it was given up or the asset received, whichever is more clearly evident. So in the past, most of the time, since we use cash, we are technically doing what is given up because cash is more clearly evident than the value of the car. Okay, we also assume that you probably wouldn't buy a $10,000 car for $10. Um, now, there are times with related parties that you can, but again, the car, the $10 is more evident. So cash is usually what we use, but what happens if you give land for land? you're going to use whichever one is more clearly evident. So if you had an appraisal that you felt, two or three appraisals that on one piece of land that were more obvious than another piece of land, you would use whatever is more clearly evident. So if you uh, purchased land and gave up a building, again, the problems have to tell you. But I will tell you that if you give up cash or marketable securities, that value is pretty evident and would be more apparent than the value of the property plant that you're receiving. However, if you get a piece parcel of land in exchange for something else, uh, let's say services or um, another piece of land or another property plant and equipment, um, it, you might not know which is more clearly evident. Okay, so that's the first one. Um, couple other things that we need to do, uh, cash discounts. Discounts for prop, prompt payment. Um, these are, you would basically deduct it from the cost of the asset. Uh, deferred payment contracts. Um, so if I paid $10,000 a year for the next five years, think back to chapter six, I would have to take the interest out. So I would get the present value of an annuity I said $10,000 a year for five years. I think that's what I said. So I would take the present value of an annuity for $10,000, five years, and I would put an interest rate on it that seemed appropriate, and I would bring it back to today. So $10,000 times five years is $50,000. So the, I would debit the property, plant, and equipment for some amount less than $50,000 because... I would have um, interest in there. Lump sum purchases. So if I purchased, um, let me pause this. Okay, so this is a lump sum purchase. I just threw this together. So let's say that we purchased a, a piece of property that the building uh, was valued at 10,000, the land was, off, was valued at 60,000, but I bought it for 55,000. So I know that I need to debit uh, building and I know I need to debit land. And I know I need to credit cash. And I know that my credit to cash is 55000 So the question is, how much do I debit building and land for? This is a lump sum purchase. So notice I allocate the total cost among the various assets of the basis of the relative fair market value. So notice basically what I'm saying is if the building is 10000 out of the 70000 um, then it's one-seventh of the of the fair market value, so it should be one-seventh of the purchase price. So I just take individual divided by the total times the amount that I want to give to it. So um, building gets one-seventh of the 55,000, so 10,000 uh, divided by 10,000 divided by the 70,000 gives me the ratio times my 55,000 I paid for. It. So the building is going to get, wasn't very good, $7,000.
seven eight five seven and the land is going to get six sevenths of the purchase price so individual sixty of the seventy thousand times the cash paid for it's fifty five thousand so notice if I add um, the 7857 plus the 47142, I've allocated the 55,000. So proportionally, one seventh of the fair market value, one seventh of the purchase price. Six seventh of the fair market value, six seventh of the purchase price. Um, next one, issuance of stock. The market price of stock is issued is a fair indication of the cost of the property acquired. I, I'm not really even sure why they say this one. Because if I go back to the previous slide, the fair value of what is given up or the fair value of the asset received, whichever is more clearly evident, if I gave up stock or I received stock in exchange for land, um, or if I gave away land, but let's just say I gave away stock to receive land, um, stock is usually more clearly evident than the land, so that's what I do. So issuance of stock kind of follows the same rule. What if I exchange assets of giving instead of giving cash? Okay, besides the capitalization of interest, this is um, the other difficult thing in this chapter. Uh, what if I exchange assets and give instead of giving chat cash? Do I have a gain or loss? So um, again, it goes back to our land for land example that we use. Whatever is more clearly evidence, the fair value of the given up or the fair value of the asset received. And I should recognize gains and losses only if the transaction has commercial substance. So first of all, hopefully we'll talk about commercial substance. Um, an exchange has commercial substance if the future cash flows change as a result of the transaction. So in other words, if the two parties economic positions change. So for instance, if I had a black Prius and you had a red Prius and we decided to switch those, that would not have commercial substance because our economic positions did not change. However, if I gave you my black Prius plus $10,000 to get your four wheel drive truck with no cash exchange, then our economic positions have changed. It has commercial substance. So these are pretty important that you need to write down this over here. If the transaction has commercial substance, recognize gains and losses immediately. So go ahead and write it down because this is hard to remember. If it lacks commercial substance, so again, we exchange my black Prius and your, with your red Prius, and no cash is received. Make sure you write received. Don't put no cash because received is important. It is not paid, it is received. So you're going to defer gains but recognize losses. If, you, if it lacks commercial substance but we receive cash, so in other words, I have a black Prius and you have a red Prius, but I exchange mine, but you also paid me a couple hundred bucks, maybe because mine has fewer miles on it or something. We're going to partially recognize the game, but we're going to recognize losses immediately. So, again, if it has commercial substance, you recognize both gains and losses. If it lacks commercial substance, you always recognize losses but maybe not all the gains, okay? So we're gonna go through this. Notice if cash is 25% is or more of the fair value exchange, you treat it as having commercial substance. So exchange has commercial substance. I like to say down here, if cash is received, if 25% or more of the transaction is cash and you received it, you treat it as having commercial substance, which really makes some sense if you got a car plus a ton of cash, then maybe it did have commercial substance. So three things, has commercial substance, treat it as normal, recognize gains and losses, lacks commercial substance and you get a lot of cash, more than 25%, you treat it as commercial substance. If it lacks commercial substance and no cash is received, um, you defer gains, 
if you cash is received, you have, may have some gain, but in all cases, you always recognize losses. So you can write this several ways to yourself. And in fact, I would encourage you to write it several ways right on this paper. You can write it like this, or you, and then you can write always recognize losses. When you don't recognize losses, I'm sorry, when you don't recognize gains as if it lacks commercial substance, no cash, always defer gains, some cash received, I'm sorry, no cash received, always defer gains, some cash received, partial. Okay, um, why do we recognize losses immediately? Um, basically kind of a, the premise of conservatism. Always recognize losses. Okay, so what I'm going to show you, I would encourage you to get your hand out and write this up above here on this one. Um, and then we're going to put another one over here. So keep it on this half on the upper margin of your paper. Okay, so get this up here. Um, Information Processing Inc. trades its used machine for a new model at Jared Business Solutions. The exchange has commercial substance. So remember, it has commercial substance, which means I recognize gains and losses. So yay, you're going to be happy about that. The used machine has a book value of $8,000. Original cost $12,000, less $4,000 accumulated depreciation. So I'm going to put the old machine here. It's got a cost of twelve, dollars accumulated depreciation of $4,000 with a book value of eight. dollars So write those three things down. Okay, again, up in the margin above this. Um, and a fair value of $6,000. So the fair market value is $6,000. So in essence, if I got $6,000 for something on my books worth eight, dollars I had a loss of two. So make sure you write that loss. Sometimes I put it outside here because... Um, and just put loss of two, so sometimes that helps. Um, the new machine lists for 16, so I have a list 16,000 lists. They give a trade-in allowance of 9,000, so I give a trade-in allowance of nine, but the list price is 16. Um, so basically, since the list price is 16, a trade-in allowance means they're taking 9,000 off of it for the old machine, so I have to pay cash, probably should put that in, cash, of $7,000. Spell it right though. Okay, so anyway, so my cost of my new machine um, is $13,000. You can also do this, um, add that to the top of it also, so you can have two things going. Okay, so basically, since I do record gains and losses, the journal entry is pretty easy. I would encourage you to put old and new after this, okay? So get the old equipment off your book. So write old after this. So equipment old, it costs 12,000. So I'm gonna, right here, I'm getting old equipment off my books. 12,000, get the accumulated depreciation off your books because every piece of equipment has two accounts. Um, get the new equipment on your book. Well, actually I'm gonna hold that off for right now and show you that you that's your check figure. Okay, I'm going to credit cash for what I paid. Do not get um, cash flipped. Think about a little bit whether you paid or received cash because that's very important. So here I paid cash, $7,000. Since it has commercial substance, I record the loss. And then if you notice, I have $19,000 on my credit side, $6,000 on my debit side. I need $13,000 to balance. So I plug my equipment for 13. And if you look at the previous slide, if I if you wrote it down in the margin, I do have $13,000 there, okay? You don't necessarily need to do this if you have all this. So again, get the old equipment off your books, cost and accumulated, uh, record the loss of 2,000, record your cash. In this case, I paid cash of $7,000. Again, if I receive cash, make sure you know it's on the debit side and then you plug equipment for the difference. So that's this one, and hopefully you wrote above here uh, your computations. So notice if it has commercial substance, um, I would recognize the gain. So I'd go through the same process, except in this little thing, I would have a gain, I'd record the gain and go through the same process. Um, interstate company exchanges a number of 
pauses. Okay, this one's um, slightly different. They don't give you the same information. So they have used trucks with a book value of 42. So my cost is 64. $22,000 accumulated depreciation, so it has a book value of 42. It says the fair market value is 49, so in essence, pretend you sold them for 49. They're on your books for 42, so I have a $7,000 gain. Remember, I record gains. And it says my best pay 11,000 cash, so I give, gave my $11,000 cash trade-in. Um, we're going to find out that that ends up $60,000 without actually doing it. Um, let's go to the journal entry. So get the old equipment off your books. Get the old equipment off your books for 64 cost. Accumulated depreciation of 22. Remember, um, trucks are an asset, so to get it off your books, you credit it. Accumulated depreciation is a contra asset, so it has a normal credit balance, so to get it off my books, I debit it. I record my gain. I record the cash I paid, so again, take a Second to think about whether that I paid cash and I plug trucks for the difference, which is $60,000. And if I went back, you can see that indeed it's $60,000. So, so far I've got a loss, no, I have commercial substance in commercial substance. Notice has commercial substance. Okay, um, so when I have commercial substance, um, I record my gains and losses, so you can look at the journal entries there. But now I'm going to go into lax commercial substance. Lax commercial substance is, is the harder one. Um, when no cash is received, so, maybe, so basically we're back to the first problem. So look in your upper margin where you should have written this. If you didn't write it, um, you're much better than I am um, because I would have to write it down. So our cost was 12,000. We had accumulated depreciation of four. The book value was eight. The fair market value was six. So I would have had a loss of two. Um, the list price of the other one was 16. So they gave them a $9,000 trade-in allowance. So I paid $7,000 cash. So what we do now is we would record um, A loss so I've got the wrong problem up here so I'm gonna to have to pause this again and I'm pausing it because we would record the loss we always record losses so in essence the entry would be exactly the same as the entry you wrote down right here because you always record losses so if it has commercial substance or it lacks commercial substance this entry is the same because you always record losses however this one I have to record, um, I have a loss and it has no co commercial substance, so I need to defer it. So I need to go back and fix my Excel. Okay, so now we're better. We actually have a loss of $7,000. So my fair market value, actually have a gain of $7,000. My fair market value is 49, my book value is 42. So I have a gain of $7,000. So. I lack commercial substance and I have a gain. So when you lack commercial substance and you have a gain, then I have to ask myself, did I receive cash? And in this answer, I gave cash, I did not receive cash. So again, the importance of stopping and thinking about that in your journal entry. So in this case, I gave it. Okay, so uh, the steps are fairly simple. Um, kind of the same as what I've done before. I get the old asset off your books. So I credit truck for 64. I get the accumulated depreciation off your books. I record the cash I paid, which is 11,000. I look here, I have a gain. I cannot record the gain. So I plug the difference to trucks. So trucks gets $53,000. So it's as easy as that. If I go back, if you look at your um, journal entry for this one right here, and you cross off the gain that I recorded because I cannot record it, and then plug the truck. Uh, it's kind of the same process. If you stop in the problem with plugging the new truck, you'll be pretty well off. The last one is the hardest one. Okay, so when I 
Receive, receive cash. It lacks commercial substance. So two things. It lacks commercial substance and I receive some cash. I defer part of the gain. And here's my uh, computation. It is basically how much is the cash of everything. I really wish they put an equal sign after this because if the cash, if this fraction is more than 25%, um, you recognize the gain. Um, but anyway, so we'll go through this. And I want you to subtotal after that so you can see if it's more than 25%. So I could go back to that prior slide that we had that I said if it's greater than 25%, you treat it as having commercial substance. Okay, so um, this is our problem, so I need to change my Excel spreadsheet here. So, Okay, so we traded a used machinery that cost 110, accumulated depreciation of 50, so it had a book value of 60, um, and a fair value of $100,000, so my fair market value is $100,000. So I have a gain of 40,000, so I got I would have gotten $100,000 for something worth on my books uh, worth sixty. dollars um, It receives, I shouldn't put this there, let me do it. List there. Okay, and um, I got a new machine with the fair market value of 90 and I also received cash of 10 so basically, I gave an old machine worth $100,000, and I got a new machine worth $90,000 in cash of 10. So notice what I gave and got are the same thing. Okay, so this is what I need to do. And then, so now I need to figure out what percentage of the exchange price was cash. So I have $10,000 that was cash right there. And of the entire amount, I got a machine and cash. So I got $100,000. So I want to know what percentage that is. So that is 10%. So 10% of the purchase price was cash. So notice that is not greater than 25%. So if it's greater than 25%, I treat it as commercial substance. I recognize the gain and go on. But since it was received cash and lacks commercial substance, I take that... Um, times the amount of gain. And so notice I have a $40,000 gain. So I want my gain to come down here. And so I've recognized 10% of my gain. Okay, so cash divided by the entire amount that I got, cash divided by got, what I got, is 10%. It's not greater than 25%, so I take it times the gain and I recognize 10% of the gain. So let's look at the journal entry. Okay. All right. So I have my go through the steps, get the old machine off your books. It cost me 110, so I credit a, a machine for 110. I get the accumulated depreciation off my books for 50. Um, we're going to hold off on this. Look at the cash. Stop. You receive cash. You didn't pay it. If, there, if I had a dollar for every time people put cash backwards on these, um, we could have a party. But anyway, so I got cash of 10000 on it. I recognized 4000 of my gain. The last thing you do is credit, is debit the new machine, and it's just simply a plug figure. So I've got 114,000 on this side. I have 60,000 on this side, so I need 54 to, to balance. Okay, so again, I have received cash and it lacks commercial substance, so I have the hardest one there. So I take my cash divided by everything I got is 10%. If it was more than 25%, I'd recognize the entire $40,000 gain and plug the new machine. So this would be $40,000. This would be fourteen. dollars Okay? Um, whatever that equals, I'd plug it. Okay? Um, but I recognize $4,000 of the gain, and I plug the machine. So there you go. Okay, this is just a summary of of everything that we've done. Um, here's another illustration. Uh, we'll probably just um, 
maybe do this one in class and you can look here and, and do it on your own and see if you can get it. Okay, um, what do you do with contributions? Um, basically, you put it on your books for the fair value of the asset. So a lot of not-for-profits like Quincy University will get contributions. So if you gave them your car, they would debit car for the fair value and you will have contributions revenue. So contributions for not-for-profits is one of their biggest sources of income right here. Okay, um, and so again, you just put it for the fair value and you have contributions revenue. So we donated a land with a fair value and so they do donate land and contributions. Pretty simple. Okay, what happens if we contribute? So in this one, we received a contribution. What happens if we give a contribution of a non-monetary asset, non-money? Okay, so we, basically what you do is you pretend you sell it, but instead of debiting cash, you will debit contribution expense. So we have uh, credit land for 80, which is on our books and we got it for, um, it was worth $110,000. So you actually, it's pretty important that you have a valid appraisal for this and you actually have to attach it to your tax return and things like that. So we have contribution expense and record the gain. All right, what about uh, amounts that I spend after I buy the asset? Uh, so basically, um, if I want to add it to the cost of the asset, there are three rules. If it significantly increases its useful life and, or, and its value or its value, you will capitalize it. So useful life must be increased. The quantity of units uh, produced must be increased. Notice it's one of these. I'm not really sure. I would have put this one because it's useful life and quantity of units seems to be about the same thing. And the quality could be enhanced, so you're making them better. So if these are uh, one of these three incurred, you capitalize it, which basically means you debit the asset. All right, so these are uh, major types. So additions increase the extension of an addition existing assets, so you add on an addition to a building, you put on a, a dump bed on a truck, um, improvements and replacements, you do a major overhaul, um, you can even rearrange or reinstall it. Um, so all of these are, are some of our major types of expenditures, but repairs, you just maintain the working condition of the assets, you debit repair expense. Okay, applying some of this to real life. So WorldCom is a, a corporate fraud case that's uh, pretty well known. So what did they do? They incurred line costs. And basically these line costs uh, benefited the, bill, the business for a year. So most of you would debit rent expense, line rent expense. Uh, WorldCom was a telephone company, so they were renting telephone lines. So um, we would have line rent expense and cash for 3.1 billion. What did they do? They capitalized it. They debited the asset line costs. And so what happened is they took it out of expense and they put it into an asset, which increases your assets and decreases your expense. If you decrease your expense, you increase your net income. They also had um, notice where you would have land, you would add it to the cost of the land. So a cost of the business would be added to the cost of purchase of the business. They amortized it um, instead of doing that. So you would have had no amortization. Here they had amortization, um, which basically had a pretty high uh, impact on net income. So net income would have been a loss, but they reported 1.38 billion of net income and there were other things so notice 
that this is increasing at 0.3.1 and this is amortized. You can divide that by 10 years. Okay, um, you can kind of read through this, but the important things that basically you capitalize things that are increase the value of the asset or extend its useful life, but if it is um, just maintains the working condition, we expense it. Um, all this slide does is tell you that if you sell an asset mid-year, you need to take a partial year depreciation. So if you go back to any of the asset sales we had, um, you would first update your depreciation to the date of sale. So in this one, they're depreciating at $1,200 a year. So before I sell it, I have to take half a year depreciation. So then I would get the asset off my books for $18,000. Let me see if I do this. Okay, get the asset off your books for $18,000. Get the accumulated depreciation off your books, which includes the, so 9 times $1,200 will give us an amount, and then I would have an additional $6,000 or $600 on it. So the 9 years times 12 plus the $600 is $11,400. So get the accumulated depreciation off your books. Okay, so 9 times 1,200 is 10,800, so 10,800 plus that additional 600 is 11,400. Record the cash of 7,000, and I have a gain. So that's as simple as that. Involuntary conversion, what happens if you have a flood, fire, theft, etc.? Basically what you do is you assume you sold it to the insurance company. So remember that. You sold it to the insurance company. So Camel Transport, so this is on your handout, so go ahead and fill it out. I think it's the last thing, yay. Um, they had to sell a plant that stood in the pathway of an interstate highway. Um, okay, so Camel Transport had property that stood in the path of an interstate highway. The state had sought to purchase the land. Uh, the company resisted. They ultimately exercise the right of eminent domain, which basically means uh, the government can buy your land if, if they want to build a highway or pipeline or whatever in the heck they want a national park, um, they can buy it from you. Um, and the courts upheld it. They received $500,000 cash. And so what happens? In essence, you sold it. So if this had burned down and I got from my insurance $500,000, I sold it. So First thing is I get the assets off my books. The cost was $400, so plan assets are debits, so I get them off my books with credit, get the accumulated depreciation off my books, which is a contra asset, normal balance credit, so I debit it. Um, record the cash I received. I received $500,000, in this case from the state, but it could be the insurance company. If I need a credit to balance, it's a gain. If I need a debit to balance, it's a loss. There you go, and we are done.